Welcome to a new episode of Jews in the World. I am Phyllis Zimbler Miller, and today I have a very special guest. He's a very prominent Dutch Holocaust historian, and he's going to fill us in on information about the Jewish Council during the Holocaust. He's going to say his own name because I cannot pronounce it, his whole name. I want to give him credit. But let me just tell you that he is Professor Emeritus of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the University of Amsterdam. He was also the director of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies in the Netherlands. Numerous books, publications. He's the person who knows. So we're going to get it from the horse's mouth. So welcome. Please say your name. And okay, then my let's name, talk. Yeah. Okay, my, okay, my name is Johannes Houten Kassel, and I'm very glad to talk to you. Um, let me explain. Uh, the Nazi occupiers in very many uh, different European states um, instituted Jewish councils. Uh, the German word was Judenrat, and the Jewish councils were for the first time heavily criticized uh, by Dr. Hannah Arendt in her book on uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the Benghazi. Um, Following that book, there was a famous exchange between Dr. Arendt and Professor Gerson Scholem of Hebrew University, which he, in which Gerson Scholem criticized Hannah Arendt in return for her criticism of the Jewish Council. He explained that there were very many different types and forms of council presidents. There were heroes, uh, there were scoundrels, and there were people now, um, in the Netherlands, the topic of the Jewish councils after that never entirely disappeared from the agenda. Um, there are other European formerly uh, occupied countries in which the Jewish councils have uh, been much less of a debate. Um, there was not much of a debate in Paris, for instance. Jewish councils were notably absent uh, in the former Soviet Union, and uh, perhaps um, one of the more infamous examples, which Council of Budapest, um, which um, managed to bring um, a large group of family members and friends surrounding their Jewish Council uh, into safety. Now, um, we the Dutch have been discussing this topic uh, over and over again. And the latest reason to do that was that there was a five a series, a television drama, which was uh, screened, aired uh, here over the last month. Now, the problem I have with the focus on Jewish councils is that usually um, their power has been uh, overestimated. At the end of the day, the uh, the council presidents, wherever in Europe, um, were as vulnerable uh, as all other Jews. Um, and from an Nazi point of view, it would have been absurd uh, to have a situation in which Jews would have too much influence on the deportation process. At the end of the day, what the Jewish councils more, most often did was that they took care of the sick and the elderly, that they made sure that the children went to school, that there was some sort of organized Jewish community life, even during these very dreadful circumstances uh, of, the, of the Holocaust. Now, uh, in the Netherlands, because um, so many of the Jews from occupied Holland were deported and subsequently murdered, um, there was a lot of ill feeling. Um, and so the returning Jews, the very few returning Jews in 1945, of course, everybody was extremely traumatized and distressed. People felt that they needed somebody to blame. And of course, the most obvious person to blame because the Nazis were no longer present um, was the Jewish Council. And in that moment in time, 
as I just said, people tended uh, to overestimate the relative influence of the Jewish Council. Actually, the influence and the collaboration of the Dutch Gentile civil servants, and their help in speeding up the deportation process, was way more important than the relative influence of the Jewish Council. Can I, I just read something that I thought was very interesting. If I'm saying, repeating it correctly, that the Dutch collaborators got so good at rounding up the Jews that eventually they didn't even have any Gestapo or, or, or others with them. They, went, they were the ones who, who picked up the Jews. Is that correct? Yes. yes, there were numerous instances in which the Jews in Amsterdam, but also outside of Amsterdam, actually were not arrested by German policemen, were arrested by the Actually, the greatest um, street raid, and the only one which truly a national character, is that Jews were rounded up and arrested all over the Netherlands, was the street raid of the 2nd and 3rd of October 1942. Um, during that day and subsequent night, over 15,000 Jews, um, men, women, and children, uh, were arrested. That action totally performed by the Gentile. There was not a German involved, not a single one. So, did I hear you right? October 3rd, 1942? Yeah, yes, 2 and 3 October 1942. Okay, so that I didn't know. And that was not just in Amsterdam, but throughout this, the yes. uh, country. And actually, actually, from the Nazi point of view, it was a very important street raid because it meant um, that the transit camp um, was so filled with new prisoners at that moment in time that Eichmann could be satisfied because he had met his own quota of 40,000 Jews to be deported from the Netherlands in the second half of 1942 on account of each retreat. So for those of the people who don't know, in Holland, Westerbork was the transit camp. And sure. what I find interesting, and again, our esteemed guests will correct me, it was originally built as a uh, holding place for Jews, for example, getting out of Germany in time. Yeah. And I just read an account that in the very beginning, they even had little rooms of families together rather than barracks. Yeah. And then the Germans, yeah, then go ahead, you tell the story, you're the expert. Okay, um, well, originally, uh, the idea of the pre-war Dutch government uh, was to have a concentration camp um, uh, for all of the German, the Jewish refugees. And, um, that, pro that, that entire project uh, was redeveloped into a much more modest form, which in practice meant that only the German unmarried Jewish refugees who had come to the Netherlands uh, without legal permits uh, were held in Westerbork, which meant that Westerbork was not a um, place of detention for 15,000, 20,000 persons, but a merely 800 people stayed there. Then uh, in the summer of 1942, when the Nazis who were occupying the Netherlands decided that Westerbork was to be the transit camp, the camp was enlarged, uh, and very many new barracks were built, and um, it was developed into a transit camp, uh, which um, was uh, steadily overcrowded Deplorable place to be in, in particular, because of the lack of privacy, but also of of recurrent illnesses and sicknesses. Um, there was a small German Jewish elite in that particular transit camp. In that sense, the work was a typically Nazi camp, in the sense that in most Nazi camps, it was formed from the groups who were held there as the first prisoners in the camp. In Westerbork itself, there was uh, there were very many conflicts between the German uh, Jews um, who 
played some role in the administration of the camp, who merely passed through. So, okay, now we're now in, in October of 42, 50,000 Jews are sent to Westerbork. Then what happens? Well, um, in uh, 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 the camp more or less uh, exploded because there were way too many prisoners. Um, the camp became a chaos. Um, the official German Nazi effort was to transport a German to uh, and, well to transport Jewish families as families. At that moment in time, that proved impossible. So uh, the men were put on separate trains uh, from the women uh, and the children. And um, there were very many trains going to the east, particular weeks following this mass raid. Um, and in, in fact, this meant, as I just said, uh, that Eichmann had met his own quotum of 40,000 Jews um, in his view, which we reported from the occupied Netherlands in the second half of 1942. Now, did the trains go to Bergen-Belsen and Auschwitz both, or, or other places? Um, at that moment in time, uh, all the trains went to Auschwitz-Birkenau uh, because the trains to Belsen and to Wiesenstadt and Sobibor uh, departed at a later moment in time. Okay, that's started, uh, the Sobibor uh, was the period March, July 1943, and transports to Bergen-Belsen and to Wiesenstadt it um, took place even later, still the latest departing in September. September 44, your voice dropped, right? And as we know, Anne Frank and other people in the annex were um, arrested in August 1944, and then they were on one of the last trains to go. Absolutely, yes. Uh, and, and that was a, a train which um, the transport, which largely con consisted of so-called S cases, uh, which means people, who, the Jews who were specifically to be punished even more harshly than others. The official Nazi version was for Frank and her family um, part of a transport, which to a very large extent um, consisted of Jews had, who had been arrested in hiding places were first uh, uh, sent to Birkenau, as you know, and the more remnant group was transported from Birkenau to Bergen. And yes. that's where, where Anne Frank died. Yes. So let's go back up to discuss the Jewish Council a little more. I want to make sure that my listeners understand that the Nazis appointed people. Yes. You might want to say how they chose them in, in the Netherlands to control the Jewish population, to be so that when people say the Jewish council had autonomy, no, they were under the Nazis, but they were the group set up to control the Jews. Yes, well, um, in the beginning, um, the Jewish council saw itself as a means of Jewish representation, as a way to talk um, with the Germans to remain some sort of contact Germans, on their part, uh, saw the Jewish Council merely as an instrument of communication, not of negotiation, uh, as a way to communicate to the Jewish population at large um, what, um, which new measures were taken against them, which things they were no longer allowed to do. Um, so from the beginning, the both sides involved in the process, the Nazis and the Jews, um, had very different perspectives. It happened, happening. The, the Germans um, saw the Jewish councils as an instrument of force and coercion, and the Jewish representatives on the council hoped that they would be able um, to find some ways to alleviate the plight of the Jewish community and to find ways to keep community life going in one way or 
extent that they felt that the sick had to be cared for, that the children sent to schools, that there had been that there had to be some form of Jewish community life, even under a Nazi occupation. These forms of Jewish community life, in a way, can be viewed as Jewish resistance, I think. Buddha Bauer coined a term for that, he called it Amida, and these are efforts um, to keep Jewish life more or less intact in possible circumstances. Um, and these efforts very often were successful and managed uh, to keep some form of Jewish community life more or less in, uh, intact uh, until, of course, uh, the Germans decided uh, these forms of community life um, had to end. And that's what also happened in Amsterdam. Three large street raids on Amsterdam Jewry in the summer of 1943. The Jewish Council was finally, finally dissolved by the Nazis on the 1st of September 1943. Yeah, I yes, just wanted to say, no, no, I just wanted to say that I found it very interesting in uh, the book that I'm working on, The Boy um, Behind the Door, that there was a theater that was, I think, called the Holland or Dutch Theater that was turned into yeah. the Jewish theater. And when yeah. Jews were no longer allowed to go to any other theater, they were allowed to go to that theater until the Nazis turned that theater into the holding point in Amsterdam for arrested Jews yes. before sending them out. Absolutely correct, uh, Phyllis. Uh, it, actually, it was one of the holding uh, points. Um, uh, the people who were arrested during the, the mass street raids did not stay in the Jewish theater. They uh, were um, transported to the um, train station uh, on the very same day. But because that theater still exists, um, the, the memory of the deportations more or less sticks to that particular building and the relative size of the, uh, of the number of Jews who've been in that building uh, sometimes is a treachery. Well, thank you for that information because I did think that everyone was taken to the Jewish theater. And well, so actually, in the, during the first weeks of deportation, the Jews went on foot. And so they were not held in the theater. Those who were um, who belonged to the elderly and the sick it, it, it usually did not stay, stay in the theater. And the victims of the mass street raids in Amsterdam in 1943 also did not. But but uh, in 1942, in that summer, it was used. Yes, absolutely. It, 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 um, I think that the Nazis started using it. Um, say, at the end of August 1942, and stayed in use until November 1942. So I, I want to go back to your article that I've read about why this five-part series, which is, it's called in Dutch, the, well, I can't say it, but it's the Jewish Council in English, even yeah. though it's not available yet in English. What do you feel the five-part series got incorrect? Um, I think that the but, well, it is television drama. So actually, um, there are many historical fallacies in that particular series. And what surprised me, actually, was that the makers of the drama did not have a sort of disclaimer at the very beginning of their TV, which is usually, say, for instance, on, on Netflix series. I mean, there's, and there's uh, a small text, um, written by the makers of the film, in which they state that um, many of the things which you will see um, have truly occurred, but that it has been dramatized for television purposes, um, that the new characters have been added and that other characters are no longer present, um, and that you should not see the TV drama as an uh, accurate historical document. Now, um, what um, struck me was that there was no such disclaimer 
uh, in the film, and that actually the director in the television documentary, which was aired a couple of days ago before the first episode, actually said that they had stayed very close to the historical truth. Then, of course, I felt free to compare uh, um, television drama with the historical truth as I see it and note that there were very many differences. This is, of course, apart from the problem, uh, apart from this, there are two other major historical problems. One of the major historical problems is that the influence of the Jewish Council on the deportation process, as I said earlier, um, was slight in comparison to the importance of the collaboration of Dutch Gentile civil servants, including the Dutch police, which we discussed earlier. Another matter is that these German, that these Dutch Gentile co collaborators mm -hmm. involved in our civil service, that they were not. Uh, really punished um, after the liberation. The only ones who were punished were the Dutch Gentiles who became national socialists. Because they had betrayed uh, the Queen, the government in exile, and so on. So government officials who had issued manifestly illegal orders say, to policemen to arrest innocent Jews, or tram drivers to bring Anne Frank in a guarded tram to the central station, guarded policemen and with carabines, with large guns. These people were not thrown out of their office in 1945, only the National Socialists were. And I feel that the situation in which Dutch Gentile civil servants, collaborators, were not punished after the liberation, that creates a situation in which you should be very careful in trying to bring Jewish leaders um, to appear in front of judges, as was considered in the Netherlands in the winter of 1940. In, I think it's absurd in a situation in which Gentile collaborators um, are not fired, they do not even lose pension rights. Um, then in that circumstance, it is very strange that you consider criminal proceedings against Jewish leaders who were as vulnerable as all other Jews and whose influence on the deportation process was way more marginal than uh, of the Dutch Gentile collaborators. What criminal, this I don't know, what criminal proceedings? Well, they were, the two presidents of the Amsterdam Jewish Council were arrested. Uh, they were held in custody for six weeks. Wait, wait, you mean after the war was over? Yes, yes, yes. Um, in uh, November and uh, December 1947, there was a national outcry um, the public prosecutor uh, who was involved in this then had to back down. In the meantime, one of the two presidents, Abraham Asher, who had come from Bergen-Belsen uh, as a broken man, died in 1950 and it lasted until 1951, until the official decision was taken not to have a court case uh, against the other surviving Jewish council president by the name of David Cohen. So, um, in a strange and paradoxical and more or less absurd way, the presidents of the Jewish council were punished more harshly, namely with six weeks imprisonment, than uh, the prominent Dutch civil servants who had given illegal orders to Dutch policemen or to Dutch tram drivers. Now, I mean, that seems... Yes, wait, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but what, tell us about the illegal orders. That I don't know about either. Well, um, if, uh, imagine that you are a police commissioner and that you give Dutch policemen, ordinary civil servants, uh, the order uh, to pick up and arrest innocent Jews who have not done anything against the law. Then a child understands that that order in itself is illegal. 
Yes, it is illegal to transport Jews as prisoners in Dutch trams, which are guarded by armed German policemen. Uh, um, the director of the tramway, who gives such an order to a Dutch tram driver, um, of course is aware of the fact is that he's issuing an illegal order. So it's, as I said, it's strange that people who issued the illegal orders uh, were not punished, whereas the presidents of the Jewish Council were, that seems to be uh, absurd in my opinion. I, I do think that the Netherlands has tried very hard to have an international image that there weren't as many collaborators as uh, in my recent research, I've discovered there were. And that's absolutely correct. Um, we have, um, well, of course, uh, we were as a country lucky in the sense uh, that we had Anne Frank in her diary uh, as the symbol um, of the Dutch experience. Whereas, um, actually, um, we're not the country of the people who were hiding Anne Frank, but now we are finding out that we're the country of the tram driver who brought uh, the Anne Frank family um, uh, to the central station and from there to the transit camp and from there to the desk camp. So there is a, a huge difference between our image and the historical reality. I agree. What's, what's being taught in schools right now in, in the Netherlands? To young children, high school students. Well, um, of course, we do Holocaust education, but perhaps we do not do enough. Uh, we have the same problems with very many other European countries. And the fact that it's not easy to explain to Dutchmen with an immigration background as Muslims um, what happened during the war. And uh, we see an increase in anti-Semitism uh, after um, the invasion in Gaza and uh, the last uh, uh, and the ongoing war uh, between Israel and, um, and, and, uh, and Hamas. And I fear that there are very many school teachers in particular quarters of Amsterdam, which are primarily inhabited, inhabited people of Muslim descent, there are very many school teachers in these quarters who do not dare address the history of the Holocaust and um, the recent history of the, or the contemporary history of the Middle East. What about freedom of expression in the Netherlands right now? Are you legally able to say death to the Jews publicly? Um, no. Um, but um, now, I will try to explain. Uh, we have had um, anti-defamation laws ever since the 1930s. And these anti-defamation laws uh, were created to protect Jews against local national socialists. Our legislation um, actually only covers situations in which you insult Jews as a group. So um, in our legal system, it's possible to insult a Jew as an individual, mm. but that is not a criminal offense unless you insult him as a member of the group. So, so for instance, if you would say that all Jews are thieves, then that is clearly a criminal offense. Um, I think that if you would say and now I have to quote a horrible insult, but um, it's one of the insults which is used in, in, in the society I, uh, I live in. Um, if you use the word cancer, Jew, that, that clearly is a criminal offense. There is discussion between legal scholars whether the word cancer Zionist also um, mm. covered by this piece of legislation. Um so there's no doubt about it that we see an increase of anti-Semitism, that we see an increase of insults uh, of Jews. And um, 
that our uh, society is not developing um, in um, the way you and I would like to see it. I, I, not, yeah. I was going to say, it was pretty horrible when the National Holocaust Museum was um, inaugurated last month in Amsterdam and what protesters were able to scream at the... Uh, yeah, I agree, I agree. Uh, but in this sense, perhaps I see it in a little bit different way. Uh, I mean, uh, I knew that elderly Jewish gentleman who was involved uh, there was his great-granddaughter yes. and tried uh, to adhere the mezuzah to the building. Uh, he's been a friend of me, mine for, for uh, many, many, many years. He was a, one of the one of the co-plaintiffs against John Damian in, in Munich. Common person in the in the Portuguese Jewish community by the name of Uri Cortisos. Of course, I found it appalling that people could not stay silent for one minute. Um, also, uh, in the context of the fact that our king was arriving. I mean, yes. um, I recognize the right of people to demonstrate. And I understand that this means um, uh, that they uh, may speak up um, and that they may voice emotional statements. But I found it very difficult to understand that these people could not stay silent for a number of seconds. Mutual um, court issues have the honor of creating our king. I mean, I think that the right to demonstrate is important. I think very much as people deplored not having it under Nazi occupation. I think we're very grateful for the fact that the right to demonstrate turned to us. Also, perhaps on particular occasions, this is a, as many other rights which should be moderation. Freedom of speech does not mean that you can say everything you actually somewhere and where you insult others, that's where. So, as I see it, sitting from where I am and being involved in a grassroots project that's just starting about working on civil society in Beverly Hills, California, how do we encourage civil society in societies where they can't be quiet. They can't show the respect for the king. It's just, it just as he arrives, it just amazes me. Yeah, well, I, I think that the only way to do it is to um, have an even more stronger focus uh, on education uh, still. And um, of course, this is the task of the school teachers. It also is the task of the parents. I don't think that parents we can sit back school teachers to solve all of society's problems. So at the end of the day, I think that we also, over or all of us, should take uh, a long look in the mirror <laughs> and, <laughs> and ask what, if we really are sure uh, about the quality of our own act, to use an American expression, if I may. Yes, I think that's exactly correct. Are we modeling civic society, civic behavior, and all kinds of little things? Even like I know this sounds silly, but holding a door open for someone who's walking with the no, cane or something. No, but I uh, I agree. Um, my wife was standing in a uh, in a bus stop not so long ago. Then she saw that somebody had written um, on the glass paneling of the wood uh, of the bus stop the word cancer too. Well, of course, my wife uh, made sure that she removed uh, the first part of the book as her contribution to civilization. Well, we appreciate that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Just little things to make the Jewish community understand they're not alone and, and to teach people or model that that is not correct behavior. No, and... and um... Well, you know, there's a famous German poem which was written during the Nazi period. Um, it more or less went like this. Um, when they came to 
yes. and arrest, arrest the communists. Uh, I did not pay attention because I was not a communist. When they came to arrest the socialists, I did not pay attention because I was not a socialist, and so on and so on. I, at, the end, at the end of the day, identity is important to uh, all of us. Um, and even for that reason only, we cannot accept a situation in which people are discriminated against on account of their identity. Exactly. Yes, that quote was credited with, Martin Niemöller was credited with it. It's unsure sure. whether he, yes, I it, yeah. and I think it's exactly exactly what's important to understand though that we're talking about jews we are really talking about speaking up against all hate and as I we think. end this really fascinating conversation is there anything that you would like to add that you think uh would, we we should discuss right now no i don't think i, I think that the the Mother poem and um was a very fine summary of uh, we were talking about. I always enjoyed uh, talking to you, Phyllis. I'm uh, looking forward to our next opportunity. And um, I'm very happy with the excellent work you're doing because it's such an important tool. Well, thank you. And you know how much I appreciate your coming on the show and answering my questions when I email you about little things. And if there's anything I can do for you in the future, don't hesitate to let me know. Thank you. I may. So okay, help you. Okay. I know I'm teasing you. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>